Hi everyone. Back in middle school, when I lived in Belgium, I took a religion and philosophy course where we studied happiness. Throughout this course, we studied the following questions. What is happiness? Is it attainable? And if so, how? In the middle of the year, we read a book called L'homme qui voulait être heureux, or The Man Who Wanted to be Happy, which is a psychology book that explores the meetings between an American teacher, Julian, and the famous Balinese wise healer, Master Sam Chang. The goal of their meeting was to figure out why Julian was unhappy and what he could do to turn his outlook on life around. Each meeting concluded with a personal goal that Julian set for himself. The first meeting taught him that others see us how we see ourselves, and therefore we should not let our insecurities define us. The second one taught him to let go of his illusions of the world in order to see his surroundings without blinders. And the third meeting, and the lesson that Julian learned from it, is the one that I would like to explore with you all today. During one of their meetings, Julian is asked by Master Sam Chung why he isn't living his dream life. Hesitantly, he explains he has put up these barriers, ones that prevent him from trying something new or from asking for help from people that he knows or doesn't know. He assumes that doing these things will only create unnecessary problems. He believes he will be a burden or a waste of someone's time, despite admitting that he would help anyone who asked him. Perplexed by his contradicting explanations, the master tells him that he is confusing his fear of rejection with the rejection of a person. Most of our fears, the master explains, are created by our minds. You probably don't understand, but knowing how to turn to others and ask them something is fundamental. All the people who make a success of their lives have that ability. To challenge his patient, Master Sam Chung tells Julian that he must go up to a people of his choice and ask them things, anything, but with the goal of getting no as an answer and he must give five no's before their meeting the next day. At first, Julian thought it would be easy. He goes up to a taxi driver and says, excuse me, I don't have any money, but I desperately need to reach Kuda. Can you take me for free? Okay, okay, the driver says, I'll make you a deal. 30,000 rupees instead of 50,000, fair? No, no, I have no money, I must go for free. After a few back and forths, the driver eventually offers to drive him for free as a favor. Frustrated that the man didn't say no, Julian leaves upset. No big deal, one attempt wasted, that's all. He then approaches a tourist couple exiting a hotel. Excuse me, my car is broken down. I have no money and I need a place to stay for the night. Maybe your room? The couple first suggests that he get his car fixed at a nice Balinese car repair shop before admitting that their room is too small for the three of them. However, they had become quite close with the owners of the hotel and they would be more than willing to help him get a room for the night, despite the hotel being quite booked. Disappointed that he didn't get to know again, he thanked them for their help and left. He tried again and again with different people, but he never successfully accomplished the master's task of getting five no's. Through this test, Julian learned that he would never get an outright no. People either partially met his request or they tried to find an indirect way of helping him. In fact, both parties left the exchange mostly satisfied as Julian either got what he wanted, or partially at least, and the strangers were able to go on with their day knowing they had done a good deed by helping someone in need. Like Julian, we have probably all built this idea in our head that asking for help is a sign of weakness or failure. From a young age, we are told to be strong and independent to be the best. We build these barriers between ourselves and others, competing against them, trying to push through our struggles alone. And when stuck, we worry about what people will think of us assuming others see our insecurities as weaknesses to use against us. And we withdraw even further from our surroundings. We avoid asking for help from others, filtering what we see, hear, and feel to match our expectations of those around us. And yet, learning to ask for help and accepting it when it is offered to us are some of the most crucial life skills that we can acquire. It is by forming an interdependent relationship between ourselves and others that allows us to realize that we are stronger as a whole. These traits are key to coexisting in any environment. By simultaneously trying to improve on ourselves while aiding others, we go beyond our individual goals, personal life, relationships, and emotions to connect to something greater. This higher meaning, which could be our family, community, religion, spirituality, gives us self-actualization as we are no longer driven by purely extrinsic motivation and can turn to the deeper needs of others. This can be seen in sports, like hockey, for example, by the positive correlations that say working on your shot from the blue line as on both you as a defenseman and on your forwards as they try to tip the puck into the net. 
And on a more serious note, asking for help also extends to the world of mental health. I personally struggle with anxiety and I've been suffering from it since the third grade. And as I've gotten older, my anxiety has worsened, often making me catastrophize every big decision I face. This ranges from wondering if I made the right college choice to something as little as picking the best color scheme for my school notes. Yeah, seriously. No matter the magnitude of the difficult situation at hand, these times of confusion and vulnerability often make me feel alone as I don't wanna burden my loved ones. As I get more and more frustrated with myself, I unsuccessfully try to calm myself down as I compare the severity of my problems with those of others to convince myself that someone has it worse or I have so much to be grateful for. It just seemed easier to shut people out and to push through with it on my own, hoping that healing would come with time or however that saying goes. However, we should never belittle our feelings and we all deserve support and recovery. For me, asking for help started with me accepting the gravity of my situation and my inability to continue down the dark path I was heading in. The next step was talking to my best friend and then finally going to counseling. These seemingly simple steps took time and effort, countless times of trial and error to find the right type of counseling, right breathing exercises, calming playlists, close inner circle to confide in and more. And to be honest, it's not easy. Sometimes I just wanna give up on seeking help. I wanna go back to handling things on my own. But despite those struggles, I am grateful that I asked for help then and that I continue to do so now. You see, these interdependent relationships that I formed by opening up have allowed me to realize that I'm not alone in my struggles and that while my anxiety is not gone, I might never be fully gone, knowing that others are supporting me allows me to grow in ways that I could have never done otherwise. I can make better personal and collective decisions. I can make mistakes and learn from them and I can open up, up to my loved ones unafraid. Ultimately, I'm stronger for myself and others. This possibility to improve individually and collectively is made possible by simply asking for help, receiving advice from others, and being a part of a selfless and caring community. I find it helpful to think about a Zulu term, Ubuntu, being part of something greater than yourself. Ubuntu translates to, I am because we are. The term stems from African humanist philosophy and refers to the power of our shared community, reading kindness, compassion, and interconnectedness. This idea that all our paths are connected and that there's no part where my journey and prosperity must end so that yours can begin. This lifestyle motivates us to ask ourselves why over how, who over what, and we over me. I am because we are. Ubuntu has the power to change the world. We have seen communities from around the world come together to help others by horrific destruction caused by natural disasters, shootings, pandemics, and more, despite not being first responders, or psychiatrists, or millionaires. They are simply a collection of individuals guided by compassion and love, wanting to help with the social and physical reconstruction. If we as a society can act out of kindness when the stakes are the highest, then we can do it in regular life too, for sports, academics, mental health, and more. That day in Bali, Julian met dozens of individuals guided by compassion for him, a stranger in need. He was able to obtain a free cab ride to Cuda, thanks to an empathetic taxi driver, and a room in a crowded hotel, thanks to a kind couple. As for me, by putting my mental health first and bettering myself, I was able to become a better friend, teammate, and classmate to others, as I am now more emotionally available. Asking for help and being empathetic allows us to open up and see a whole world offering itself to us. We notice just how many people are here to help us who might have never offered their aid before because they didn't think we needed it. We build trust and transformational relationships, making a safe community where we can make mistakes and grow from them. It allows us to be stronger as individuals and as a whole. Ubuntu, I am because we are. Thank you.